This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining me today for episode 43 is Jungian analyst, author, and lecturer, Dr. Lynn Cowan. She earned a master's degree in medieval history from the University of Minnesota and holds a PhD in psychology from the Union Institute in Antioch, Ohio. She spent two years in Zurich at the C.G. Jung Institute, where she passed Propedeuticum in 1975 and then went on to complete her analytic training with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts in 1980. For 10 years, Dr. Cowan held a professorship in the doctoral program at the Minnesota School for Professional Psychology. She served as president and director of training for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts and spent two years teaching and lecturing for the C.G. Jung Center in Houston. Dr. Cowan is the author of Masochism, A Jungian View, published by Spring Publications in 1982, Tracking the White Rabbit, a Subversive View of Modern Culture, published by Routledge in 2002, and Portrait of the Blue Lady, the Character of Melancholy, published by Spring Journal Books in 2004. At a young age, Dr. Cowan developed a passion for horse racing, which continues to this day. In 2006, I attended her day-long lecture and workshop The Mythic Hero and Psyche's Call, which addressed the subjects of heroism, as it appeared in the collective psychological phenomenon, of a racehorse named Seabiscuit, who Dr. Cowan called a true mythic hero, and vocation or calling, that inner voice that prompts us to follow a certain path in life. Those topics and more will be the subject of our talk today. This interview is being recorded on Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019, through the magic of Skype. Hi, Dr. Cowan. Hi, nice to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us today. I mentioned your three books, which I would like you to briefly tell us about before we get into the material on Seabiscuit and the mythic hero and vocation. So we'll start with your first book, which I have right here. It's kind of a thin paperback book called Masochism, A Jungian View. And I've heard that it is currently out of print, but you probably can find some used copies online. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. So, you know, I I can't remember why I picked this book up, but who's not fascinated by masochism? (laughs) What is this book about? Well, it's about the fascination. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The fascination we have with masochism, especially masochism, because it's been so, I don't know the word, pathologized, negativized, so um, not cool for so long, at least in psychological circles and amongst, I think, the general public as well that if you admit to being an, a masochist, there must be something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why we never hear people go around saying, you know, oh, listen, I had a great masochistic experience the other day. How about you? Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't do that. So <laughs> so I wrote the book, but I, I was prompted by uh, <clears throat> one of Freud's thoughts, which seemed to me backwards when he was saying that religion is a neurosis, and it needs to be cured. And I thought, no, uh, it's backwards. It's sex that's not quite right. We don't understand it very well. And so it doesn't need to be cured. It just needs to be placed in its right in, in its correct context. And so I started writing some notes about that, and it just kind of grew into a small book. So now it doesn't just deal with masochism in a sexual way, the sexual aspect of it. That's right. I tried to not so much desexualize it as add another component, which seemed to me even more compelling. Mm-hmm. Was the idea of mm-hmm. masochism being a spiritual experience mm-hmm. in some way that people cannot get to except through 
uh, sexual arousal, humiliation, um, all the things, all the trappings of the play that go with masochism. And I, fi I found during my research, as anyone who's read the book can tell you, that the, the people who are most likely to have and enjoy and even enact um, masochistic fantasies are those who you would think least likely to to want that kind of involvement uh, because it's the only way they have of letting their ego go for at least a little bit. They tend to be CEOs and you know <clears throat> high stakes players and uh, you know the kind of well dressed business man or woman who just um, needs to get some relief and some release from their positions and so they so the fantasies are, are quite normal quite natural and probably everybody has had at least one at some point in their life mm -hmm. and i just wondered if that was a sort of miss well i don't, I don't want to say misguided i would say maybe not recognized um way of trying to find that kind of spiritual fulfillment and for some people it works very well I mean, I've heard, I don't, you probably have too, how many people have said, oh, you know, having sex with so-and-so was just the most divine thing. Well, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a masochism book. Um, it changed me a lot, though. I, I, was, I was able to see things very differently. And it also helped me question authority, as we used to say back in the 60s. Mm -hmm question authority and so I questioned Freud and decided that well he had his answer and now I have mine. It's not you know carved in stone but uh, it's satisfying to me to look at it from both ways. Yes and mm -hmm. and um, that is a Jungian view is to look at both sides. Right, right. So I like that. And then your second book Tracking the White Rabbit, a subversive view of modern culture. Mm. You had mentioned that that was your favorite book to write. Why, why was that? Well, it, because I, it was so funny. I mean, some of the things in it are so funny that they just made me laugh as I wrote them. <laughs> Especially the one on, uh, well, I love doing the one on eccentricity. Um, I don't have the book in front of me right now, so I can't remember the chapter names, but the one on... Um, junk food and corn-fed music mm. was great to write. It was so much fun. And uh, and it was fun to read. I did it originally as a lecture here in Minnesota, and mm -hmm. it, it was a full house, and everybody had a great time, and they started singing some of the songs I had quoted in there. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but it was, it was premised, I think, on the same attitude that Adolf Guggenhuel Crave had, when he wrote his books, because he was always looking at something from the underside or the reverse side or the opposite. And <clears throat> I thought that was so cool. Mm -hmm. And Jim Hillman, who was a huge influence on me, um, always did the same thing. And I, I always learned so much from, you know, trying to sneak under the whatever the subject was and try to see it from the underside or the backside or the other side or something. And... So in writing in writing the book, I just put together um, a bunch of lectures I had already completed and mm -hmm. went through them and uh, rewrote parts of them, but most of them pretty well stood by themselves. But writing that junk food thing was really a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Which words are carbohydrate uh, rich and which have more protein? And you know how to how do we speak? In other words, how do we use our language? to communicate what we really want to say. Because most of the time we don't. We either use euphemisms or something, um, or we just change things. You know, one of my great rants these days is the way language changes but actually becomes less precise. Mm -hmm. uh, the main word being multiple. Uh, I, I don't know what happened to the word several, or what happened to the word many, or anything. But multiple is very imprecise. I heard it used the other day when uh, <clears throat> one of the really fine horses of our generation 
won the uh, Dubai World Cup in Dubai for the second time in a row. And the report that came out in, in the press was Thunder Snow wins Dubai World Cup multiple times. Mm. That, well, now how many is multiple? Two up to what? I mean, it gives you absolutely no idea that you win this eight times in a row. Right. Or what? Multiple times. It means nothing. Multiple, multiple. But in my day, which was quite a ways back, <laughs> um, we used multiple in math class. Ah, right. He called it multiply. So, you know, that was pretty much the only time you ever heard the word. It was in some scientific or mathematical mm. Well, I won't go off onto that rant right now, but I... I well, well, I wonder, what do you think that's a reflection of how our language has changed and how imprecise it's become? I mean, I think about my mother was born in Italy, and when she moved to the United States, she had to learn English. And so she was a stickler for my brother and I when we spoke and our mm -hmm. grammar and... I am so self-conscious about it to this day. I know I don't speak correctly all the time because I'm I'm very influenced by the the people around me and the things that I'm reading. And when you read online, it's it's a mess. It, it is a mess, and we've also uh, eliminated <clears throat> what used to be called proofreaders. Mm, mm -hmm. The press, the newspapers don't use proofreaders, apparently. A lot of magazines increasingly don't. Even published books, really good books, Pulitzer Prize winning books, uh, have a, a remarkable number of um, grammatical and really? you know. And it, 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 it always, one of those things for me always works like a speed bump when I'm reading. I'm yeah. reading along, and then my eyes bump into this something. Uh, sometimes people don't finish their sentences, and so you don't know what they're talking about either. But I think it, it's a good question, what's it a reflection of? And I think part of it has to do with the fact that we uh, live electronically more than we do any other in any other mode. And when you can do things electronically like we do today, everything is instant and brief. Like, yes. since you only have how many characters, you know? Yeah, 280. Uh, so you have to condense everything, and people use, and now people use acronyms for just about everything. And if you don't know the acronym, you don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see collections of, you know, uh, letters strung together, and I have no idea what that means. And sometimes they tell you, and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. But it it seems to me a, a kind of intellectual laziness to not pay attention to what we're saying and what how we're saying it so that there are very few people on TV I, mean, I can think of two who are very good at it Lawrence O'Donnell is probably the most eloquent um, on MSNBC <clears throat> I'm a big fan of his but also Rachel Maddow um, who can really tell a story that is news that makes sense and that uses words correctly but she's very appreciated there those two are pretty rare um, most of the time they just talk and talk and talk and they don't mm -hmm. really get to the heart of things. You know, we, 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 we were very sloppy about that. And I, I do think it's a kind of laziness induced by an excessive dependence on electronic communication, mm -hmm. email, Twitter, you know, all of that. Right. And it, it, it's tiresome after a while because it's so... It doesn't really advance a thought. It doesn't advance an idea. It just takes what's there and tries to talk about it minimally. You know, we've all become language minimalists. The faster and less words we need to say things, that's how we do it. And what do you suppose is the consequence of that? What's that doing to us? Well, that's a good question, too. I hope I stick around long enough to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope it's a good thing, <clears throat> and it can certainly it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but at, at the moment, it seems to me that it is just making us more and more illiterate. Um, that, you know, the, and, and people don't read a lot anymore. Mm -hmm. 
even when you download a book to Kindle, um, well, this is my own prejudice, but <laughs> I need a, I need a book, an actual book with yep. covers and pages and you know pages you can turn and and you know there's something so leisurely and restful about it. And I don't, I never feel that way if I'm reading something on Kindle or an iPad or something like that. Yeah. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't yeah. feel like a book. It feels like a holding machine is telling me something. Mm. You know, I don't know. There's a disconnect for me there in a very sense, sensory, sensual way. I think books are very sexy. Mm. I love handling them. I love fondling them. I love turning their pages and stroking them. <laughs> And and even if it's not a great book, it's it there's still something wonderful about holding the body of the book, you know. Um, so I I worry about that. I worry that you know we may not have books. And of course, I tend to catastrophize. That's something everybody should know about me. I tend to catastrophize. Well, I can't say that. Catastrophize almost everything. Mm-hmm. So oh, now I'm worried about not having enough books, especially for people who live in California and might have their libraries burned down or something horrible like that. Right. Oh, God, it would just be terrible. Um, there are a couple of other words we use, though, that are kind of thoughtless, it seems to me, um, politically in the political um, world. Every candidate I know who's ever run for office has had to fight. They fight for better jobs, they fight for clean water, they fight for uh, children, they fight for everything. But I don't understand why we always have to fight about it. Mm-hmm. How about if we use a different word? How about if we use the word, I'm concerned about so-and-so and would like to work towards a solution, and here's my idea. But you don't have to fight necessarily. I mean, we have this warlike stance in politics. That yeah. Yeah. You know, seems to cultivate more and more war rather than real solid politics. You know? and, yeah, and I also noticed that with diseases, specifically with cancer, that people are always referring to it as a battle. Oh, a yes, yes. Battle with cancer. And I'm thinking that's not a very healing word. Right. No, it's not. And it's just like when the, the, the obituary says that so and so lost their battle with. Right lost their struggle against uh, whatever it is they died from, you know, which which is part of the larger issue we have, I think, with death, that we can't just talk about it as a normal occurrence mm-hmm. because it must be normal because it happens to everybody. And so why don't we just take that as a normal occurrence? I'm saying, why don't we just, you know, as if it were that simple. But, you know, other cultures don't talk like that. Right. They and they don't go to war a whole lot because there's they don't see the world in terms of battles won and lost, you know. Um, so that's that's kind of annoying. There's also a huge tendency, which almost everybody has probably sub noticed that is noticed under the you know, under the wire that, um. Divisive is another word. Okay. Because we tend to see things in as opposites. Things are always opposite each mm-hmm. other. So if you think we should have high taxes, and I think we should have low taxes, we're already divided. We can't just have a disagreement about this. We have to be divided. Mm. It's divisive. So everything becomes a divisive issue. But it's not necessarily divisive, it's just a, dis- a disagreement. You know, you have to shoot somebody over it. Um, that about hardworking families is another one. What about families who are not hardworking? Mm-hmm. What if they're working leisurely and enjoying themselves? Right. Um, what about hardworking single people? I mean, it seems like we only exist in terms of hardworking families. Yes. <laughs> not a yes. whole population. Yeah. So it's those kind of things that we don't really stop and think about what we are saying. And so in the end, you end up just stopping thinking. Another thing I've noticed is that we tend to repeat words and phrases that everybody else is saying. And I've been paying attention to that for years. And I've seen, noticed 
words come and go, phrases come and go, and it 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 kind of drives me crazy. Right now, the word literally, I think, is the most overused and misused word out there. Let's say it again, please. Literally. 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 People are prefacing everything mm-hmm. with the word literally. And then my all-time favorite, like literally. How's oh. that? Take that. Like literally. Come on. <sighs> We're better than that. <laughs> so let's go move on to your next book, the latest book you've written, the latest book you'd written, which is Portrait of the Blue Lady, The Character of Melancholy. And I have that one sitting right here too. Mm -hmm. And wow. It has a lovely cover, doesn't it? It really does. And it's intense. So it's it's intense. So if you would just briefly, I, I, I can't stand asking my guests to briefly do anything, but we only have so much time and i um, going to have to ask you to briefly tell us what this book is about. Well, briefly, it's about um, a phenomenon that was known from day one, as far as I can tell, um, to the present moment, which is the phenomenon of melancholy. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even sure it's an exclusively human uh, experience. I think other animals are capable of melancholy too, but human melancholy works, I think, in a slightly different way. But we have submerged that whole the whole image of melancholy. It once had an image, and it looked a lot like the blue lady <clears throat> as endures etching, which is on the cover of the book. Mm-hmm. And it, it, we've lost that in the scientific medical model, which only sees depression. And they're profoundly different. And if you've ever been really melancholic and you've ever been really depressed, you can tell what the difference is. Depression wants to go to sleep and stay there forever. Melancholy wants to do something right away, sooner is better, and be creative about it. But that doesn't mean you're going to love your situation or who you are or what you are or what you're doing. You may have profound, melancholic, really deep thoughts. I think it was Wordsworth who talked about thoughts too deep for tears, um, where there is something so deeply within you that is kind of, I don't know the word, lost maybe, or um, worried about becoming lost, or has lost hope or faith or whatever it is that's so important that you can't hardly function without it. And I used a double negative there, scratch that. (laughs) You can hardly cope with without that life. It it feels like life has stopped in some way. Mm -hmm. There's something pushing that wants to come out. You know, I don't know what it might be, a painting or a poem or a child or a sculpture or a book. Um, And I, I... I decided to write the book because when I was a child, I think I was pretty melancholic. Um, I didn't know about depression. I wasn't really depressed, but there was always a sort of sense of loneliness in me, a sense of being down under somewhere where I could breathe, but the whole world was blurry to me in a psychological sense, and things were not clear or precise or well understood and of course as you know as a child I didn't have any more power than any other child does so I couldn't change anything and I didn't even know the right questions to ask because I wasn't old enough either mm-hmm. and I think my, my melancholic mood um, <clears throat> which pretty much existed between September and June every year because that was school time <laughs> and I, right. I didn't like school. Um, I liked summers when I could be out horseback riding with my uncle and my cousin, you know, trotting around the whole mountain that way. That was fine, but the melancholic era, time of the year, those nine or ten months, there was something so um, isolating about it. And I felt like I wasn't like other kids and something was wrong with me. And, you know, it was just a matter of getting through. But I started writing when I was 10, started writing a book, Mm -hmm. 
was going to be about a racehorse who won the Kentucky Derby, and I was going to be both trainer and jockey and owner and everything. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I still have that manuscript. Do you? With about 20 pages, two sides, single spaced. Mm-hmm. I had no idea how to write a book. But I, I realized I didn't know enough to actually go to chapter two. <laughs> so I stopped and I wrote on it um, in parentheses, uncompleted due to technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have that, you know, that, that so-called manuscript. <laughs> Well, that's, that's actually, I'm, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but that actually reminds me of what you said about the end of the movie, Sea Biscuit. So we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay. Well, just to make this a little briefer, if I can, um, the older, when, I, when I became an adult, and all through those years, um, periodically I would fall into a terrible, uh, deadening depression. Oh. And all I would just sit and die. And so I thought about suicide a few times. You know, oh, there were problems. Um, there were friendship problems. There were all kinds of things that you know I couldn't seem to deal with. This is before I got into analysis. Although getting into analysis only made more problems in a lot of way. Did it? Good problems, and I had yeah. someone to help me work through them uh, and understand better where that was coming from and where it wanted to go. Mm-hmm. And then I realized a lot of where it wanted to go was into something truly creative that was authentically mine. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, especially during my internship when I was doing my PhD in a um, psychiatric ward, and I thought there's something different about people who are just depressed and people who are melancholic. And I thought of all the great artists throughout history in any field that the great ones have always been melancholic. And Beethoven, for example, Van Gogh, for example, um, um, Michelangelo, for example. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples, and all of them experienced a terrible melancholy at one time or another, but also a great depression at one time or another. And I thought these are two different things. And if you don't, if, if we stop treating depression. As, an, as a true medical illness and saw it more as a repressed figure of real creativity as in the blue lady, we might get a whole lot further with de- dealing with depression. So you would say that depression is a repression of creativity? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I think that's essentially what it is, which is why a lot of antidepressants, see, there's another battle term. Right. We, we, we use antidepressants to try to fight that off, but that's not the real problem. I think mm. that's, you know, of a, of a true creative melancholic mood, which is so tuned into the deepest core of whatever it is that makes us human, that requires some sort of expression in a creative way. Now, what would you say, I just have a quick question here, uh, about, to, to people who say, well, my depression is biochemical, you know, I have a chemical imbalance, and so I need my meds. W- what would you say to that? Well, I would say you should take care of the chemical imbalance. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to, you know, medical treatment for medical conditions. And if it really is an imbalance, then, then it should be balanced. But what I'm wondering, though, is is what you said, you know, the repression of the creativity, which I'm all on board with, mm-hmm. could that be what's causing the chemical imbalance? So oh, by by addressing the chemical imbalance with a pharmaceutical, you're not, you're not addressing the repression or that creativity that needs to come to life. Well, that's part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do, but we do this with medicine all the time. We treat the symptom. We rarely treat the cause. And, you know, I'm thinking about the ancient Greeks especially, who were authorities on melancholy. And they um, they, under, they had medicinal treatments um, for the symptoms, which appeared as depression. Mm-hmm. And they treated it um, psychologically. But they also treated it physiologically. So they had herbal remedies. 
and they had um, <clears throat> exercises you could do to help relieve some of the you know oppressiveness of depression. And there were things you could you could travel and you could take herbs and various um, formulations <clears throat> of whatever they used. And hellebore, of course, was one of their most famous. Uh, herbs. I've never t tried hellebore myself, but it's supposed to be quite the uh, quite the trip. It's 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 a very rough herb, and it can tear the lining of the rectum and get the blood flowing again, as they would say. So when you see the blood appear, and you, if you hear this as an image, as a metaphor, um, once the blood is flowing, then one comes back into life and is mm. able to deal with things. And, Oh, you know, relief, you know, relief, relief one can feel when things start moving again. And they were very concerned with the bowels and constipation and stuff. Because right. those were the symptoms. So if you could treat that with just a drug, that would be fine, I guess, if you don't mind not knowing what's below the depression. Mm -hmm. You know, depression means to press down. So I always wanted to know, well, what are you pressing down and what's under it? what wants to come up that can't. So it's perfectly okay to treat the symptoms if, if, if you're content with that, but um, I would never be content with that. And I, I think we, we lose a lot of sense of our own creativity if we try to medicalize something that can be medicalized rather than suffering the pain just a little bit and trying to see what's underneath the depression, what's being pressed down or repressed. Mm -hmm. We could add a whole lot to our culture and save a lot of money on high cost drugs. A little practicality is not my strong suit. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'd like to switch topics now and talk about what I'm. I'm just. I know I say this a lot, and I'm trying not to talk too much because I've been criticized for doing too much talking and, and instead of just letting my guests talk. But I did attend your workshop here in Chicago in 2006. The notes that I took, and I, I've already told you this when we spoke by phone earlier, the notes that I took, I'm looking at them again right here, um, mm -hmm. from March of 2006 the C.G. Jung Center in Evanston. I didn't know who you were. I knew about Seabiscuit because you and I share a very similar history. I used to be obsessed with thoroughbred horse racing when oh. I was a young child. And I was in elementary school at the time. I was living in New Jersey. There is, it's still there, a racetrack called Monmouth Park. It's in Ocean Port, New Jersey. And it was actually, it was, what's the word? It was opened, it was started in 1870. I was shocked to learn that this morning when I looked it up. Um, and I used to go to Monmouth Park with my friends and watch the racing. And, and then it wasn't until after that, that I got into quarter horses and showing horses, which I did for many years. But I also visited uh, Aqueduct Racetrack in Queens and Belmont Park on Long Island, where I was born. And then I know your favorite is Saratoga Racecourse up in um, Saratoga Springs, which is in upstate New York. All of these racetracks were opened in the 1800s, except for Belmont Park, 1905. But why are we talking about this? People are probably wondering. So you came to Chicago to present a program titled The Mythic Hero and Psyche's Call. And the lecture portion is titled Seabiscuit, the little horse that could and did and still does. And then the workshop portion is titled Many Are Called But How to Answer. And that is on the topic of vocation. So I'm sure it's very unclear to the listeners how these two things relate to each other. So I'm going to step out of the way and let you explain. Oh, well, I can do that really fast. 
Uh, it's such a small topic. <laughs> um, Not at all. You can take your time. We have all the time in the world because this is, I have to say, I'm going to just say one more thing. This is probably my favorite lecture that I've ever been to in my entire life. Oh, Not kidding. Deep. I typed up all the notes. I have them here. I'm going to tweet some of them. It mm -hmm. is the best material I have ever come across. So thank you. Thank you. I think you should talk more. <laughs> well, I and I will interject here with some of these notes because this is, again, this is wonderful. So I'm going to let you speak. Okay. Well, the, um, the, the first thing I think to say is that um, as somebody famous and smarter than me said, um, myth is the native language, the mother tongue of psychology. And <clears throat> what we know of psychology, we can learn from myth. And for the Western world, Greek mythology is sort of the foundational mythic structure that we have. Um, other myths, I'm sure, say the same thing and with different figures in different contexts, but the myth comes first, and it appears in the form of an image, as most people might know, um, portray the image portraying the emotion and the meaning of whatever the psyche is saying in that figure. So the notion of the hero is at least as old as our species. And we've always had heroes, and we always seem to know what they were, or who they were, or how they worked, or something. Um, and they were special people. They, they stood aside, they stood outside the realm of normal behavior. They had super strength, or they had super wisdom, or they had x-ray vision, or they, they saved people from, you know, um, mudslides, and wildfires and all that stuff and a lot of people still do that so in a sense they are all the beginning of some sort of representation of the of the mythic hero um but i saw the mythic hero in in the form of seabiscuit because he was so unlike any of the horse anybody had ever seen at least in, in america Although the fact that he appears in three on three different continents, not Seabiscuit himself, but the kind of racehorse he was, the hero racehorse, um, appeared on three different continents, all within the same 10-year period, and it happened to be during the Great Depression of the ninth, early 1930s. So I'm just going to jump in here. Seabiscuit was a thoroughbred racehorse yes. that raced on the scene here in the United States in the 1930s. Right. Oh, yes, I should have said that. Sorry. That's okay. Um, yes, and everybody loved him. And they loved him and looked up to him because he was a hero in their eyes. You know, he could, he was just indomitable. He would not, he was truly and only himself, which is also a characteristic of a hero, that when he does heroic things, or she does heroic things, those kind of people step out of themselves for a moment or two or three or maybe years <clears throat> and perform some activity or rescue or um, assistance in some, some profound way that is really needed by the, the larger group, the collective. And so they become heroes by doing what, but they're not, they step out of themselves for that one moment, and I think they're energized by the myth of the hero itself, which which has tremendous energy. And you can tell how often, how important our, that myth is to us by the number of times that someone is called, these days in modern terms, is called a hero. Mm -hmm. For rushing into a burning building and saving someone, or for a 12-year-old kid who rescues some a little a younger friend from the rushing waters of the um, you know raging river or something, and they get rewarded for it, and, and they should. And it's a it, and it reminds us that the the myth is still alive because that's what gives these people energy to do these things, which they would never normally think of doing. I mean, you know, it, they they really undertake. That's why we give. That's why we give the medal of honor. 
to really great heroes who sacrifice themselves in the service of something greater which they see as, you know, the, the, the lives of their fellow soldiers, or whatever the case may be. Um, sometimes we go a little too far with this so that everybody becomes a hero. Um, and in, in a way, I think that's true. I think we are all heroes at one time or another. Um, someone called me a hero, come to think of it. Just I think it was just about a week or two ago, um, because I'm having a lot of um, pain and trouble with my right hip mm -hmm. and, and she said to me boy you're a real hero the way you carry on and I thought well you know yeah big hero you know, all I've got to show for it is pain but on the other hand I can see what she was saying that she saw something heroic in me in the way I was handling the calamity I've been facing lately and and I couldn't argue with that because I thought, well, yeah, you know, I think she's right. Although, <laughs> although it doesn't feel like mm -hmm. she, you know, I'm not heroic in most occasions, but every once in a while, I think I do reach that point where I can step, where I step out of myself, and I do something that I know I can't do when I'm in normal mode. So it's sort of like being yourself on steroids or something. And what Seabiscuit did. He, he was so, uh, what's the word, he was so, um, he was so genuine, he was so himself, he was never any other horse, he was just himself. And in that sense, he epitomized all horses. Horses are very intact beings, they pretty well know who they are, and if they don't get what they need, or are treated in the way they want to be treated, they tend to get fussy and they start bucking or they start pulling away or they mm -hmm. stop eating. They do a lot of the things that humans do. They just pull into themselves and, you know, become introverts whether they are or not and pull away. And it's very difficult, especially if they're racehorses, it's difficult to, well, like any breed being trained for something, it's hard for them to really get into the work that people want them to do. You know, they're not training well or something. Um, and Seabiscuit was like that. If you didn't treat him the way he wanted to be treated, he didn't care much about you or what you wanted, and so he did whatever he had to do just to survive. So for his first two years, he was run into the ground pretty much. There's only like 32 races in his first two years. This is unheard of. I mean, anybody who did that to a horse today would be in jail for animal abuse. Um, so by the time he was three, he already pretty much had a whole career, and yet he was just finding the person then who looked into his eyes and saw something that was much more than just a low-level, you know, racehorse who just trotted around and tried to, you know, win some money. <clears throat> that wasn't who Seabiscuit was. And just and to give some perspective, um, I'm just going to cut in here. Three years old is the age of the horses that run the Kentucky Derby. That's right. It's a very young age, but it's considered the, the age of, you know, when a horse is, is, has come or is about to come fully into themselves. Um, I'm trying to think of a human comparison, but um, I can't because it's, it's too different. But in thoroughbred racing, the three-year-olds are supposedly at their peak. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't personally don't think that, but a lot of people do. And the whole, as you mentioned about Monmouth Park starting in 1870, Saratoga actually had racing there in 1848. That's right. I saw that it it was actually older than Monmouth. It is. It has the first or the oldest stakes race in the United States in 1864. Wow. And it always amazed me that you know civil um, union Civil War Union soldiers used to go there for R&R. &R. Mm. <laughs> Imagine that. Mm -hmm. Soldiers going to the racetrack for R&R. &R. Well, you had also, had also told me that thoroughbred racing was the number one spectator sport in the country back then. I think it, was, it definitely was. And it was until, actually, I think the numbers I got were 1980. Numbers of spectators, uh, you know, live attendance at the track, mm -hmm started to drop after that 
because television became more available and ultimately computers and, you know, and they say racing is failing because nobody's going to the track anymore. They're all sitting at home watching. Right. I don't think that's necessarily true because it was only two or three years ago. How many years ago was it? Less than eight years ago. Uh, people turned out so, in an excess of 70,000 spectators went out to see Zenyatta win the Breeders' Cup Classic. Mm. And I was one of them, and it was a moment I will never, ever forget. Really? It was an amazing thing. And so to come back to the notion of the hero, what Seabiscuit did was, and, and this is where he, he becomes really, truly a hero, it isn't just that he held himself together and managed to not make profound personality changes at somebody else's wish. He also did that for almost everybody who came in contact with him mm -hmm. in a deep way. So his trainer, first of all, um, Tom Smith, who was a... I think we call him a horse whisperer. You know, he knew how to talk to horses. Even more important, he knew how to listen to them. And whatever they needed, he provided. And in so doing, he was able to provide something profoundly necessary for himself, which was the idea of acceptance and a sense of belonging and a sense of making a contribution to something or someone. Because he was utterly devoted to Seabiscuit. And the two of them made a marvelous partnership. But that wasn't enough. It also took Charles Howard. He had one more person add to the circle. Now, now we're beginning to get a circle. And Charles Howard was utterly devoted to Tom Smith and Seabiscuit. And Charles Howard was Seabiscuit's owner, and he was one of the wealthiest men in the country? Yes, I was going to say that he made his fortune, I think, selling bicycles and then cars. Bicycles didn't go so well, but cars went much better. Mm -hmm. And he was in California. He made a lot of money. And um, I don't remember quite what prompted him into uh, racing, but he happened to run into, he wanted some horses, and he happened to stumble over Tom Smith. And um, the two of them got on quite well. They really respected each other very deeply. And, and I think there was a real affection between them all. You don't see, you know, people didn't express affection the same way in those days. Um, but it's there. It, it's palpable. And Charles Howard's wife, his second wife, um, was just, was right on board with all the rest of them. You know, she cared deeply about all of them. And they all kind of fed off of each other. You know, they, they encouraged each other, they supported each other, they probably had fights with each other. Um, but it was all centered around Seabiscuit, as if he was the great image of the self, as Jung would call it, capital S, um, the center of the psyche, and he was like a magnet. He drew everybody to him. There's a reason, I think, why people in Northern California used to get up at um, you know, I don't know, the middle of the night and pile into a car, they all shipped in for gas because nobody had any real money in the 30s, and they would travel to Santa Anita or wherever it was where he was working out, and he used to work out around 5 o'clock in the morning, something like that, and they would drive for hours to get there to watch him work out. Now, this is something, this is fandom far beyond fandom. <laughs> this, is, this is fanaticism already. But it also suggests that there was a real hunger in the psyche mm -hmm. in the Great Depression to see something that was so beyond one's imagination, that was so much greater than you would ever hope to be, that you would never see another horse like this, you'd never see another race like this. And they would go to the track and be there at 5 o'clock in the morning to watch this little racehorse work out. I, and I thought, that, that's phenomenal. I mean, who would do that? Does anybody get up at, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning and drive two hours to see Tom Brady in practice in football? I doubt it very much. But And one of the things about Seabiscuit, and you said little horse, that we didn't mention is that he was a, a bit of a misfit, wasn't he? He had crooked legs. He was 
blocky and kind of looked more like a quarter horse than a thoroughbred. Actually, that's a good that's a good comparison. Yes, he does, and I have a picture of him, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, over my desk, and I'm looking at it now. <clears throat> and he does. He looks like a concrete block with his legs sort of cut out, of, you know, of the block. Yeah. His, his head looks too heavy. Yeah. Neck is too short. Mm -hmm. His legs are crooked. <laughs> he does not look like Secretariat, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. He does not look like a handsome dude. Whatever. You also said that he loved being who and what he was. Exactly. He was he, he was so that's what I mean by intact. He was so himself. He was so intact. He was seamless. You couldn't say, well, this is his you know, as we do with people, this uh, this belongs to your shadow, this belongs to your persona, this belongs to your anima, whatever, you know, whatever it is. He didn't have all those parts. He just was the totality of all those parts. But you couldn't see the scenes between them. He was a, just a seamless figure. He just was who he was. Mm -hmm. He wasn't ever going to be anything else. And once his, his human supporters... And friends realized that about him. There was no stopping him. They realized that, you know, he leads, we follow. And that's what a hero does. He leads. And others follow more than willingly because they understand that there's something that this figure has that they need or they want. And so he galvanized pretty much the entire country. And people just, you know, he, when he'd ride by on the train, they'd open his car window and the train would pass by and people would turn out by the hundreds along the track just to see him go by. And children wrote, school children wrote letters to him and wished him well. And um, it was just a phenomenon. I, it, it's hard for us to imagine something like that happening in, these, yeah. because it, in quite that way because... Um, Every, anybody can get anywhere in a matter of minutes, you know, by plane or, or car or train or whatever. And we can see it happen in real time on a computer. Um, you know, if it's, if it's being televised anywhere, it's visible to, or anywhere. And I don't think, and that doesn't bring people together. It just leaves people sitting at home watching something on their computer, yeah. TV or something. And so I don't think we get that quite that feeling, you know, you sometimes maybe at the Super Bowl or the final, final, what is it, the final four, the final four, yeah, uh, in basketball, whatever it might be, where there's a big coming together, and it's particularly happening in sports. Right. It happens at political rallies, but it, it, it suggests that there's a, a need we have to see heroism in the form of sports figures. Um probably because they transcend politics. And That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It brings you, it doesn't matter, you know, if, uh, how to describe it, if your favorite quarterback is about to throw an 80-yard bomb and it's going to win the game, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. You just right. want to hit the target, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It will move hundreds of thousands of people all over the planet if it happens. You know, there's a horse racing in Australia right now. Um, her name is Winx, W-I-N-X. And she is a phenomenon. She has won 32 races in a row, Twenty more than 20 of them at grade one, which is the highest level of competition. Um, horses from other countries, champions from other countries have come and try to beat her. And she makes them all look silly. And they go home quite literally with their tails between mm -hmm. them. And all of Australia, or at least as many people who fit into any given racetrack in Australia, there are several, um, they all turn out. And they turn out just to see her walk around or, or something. And then she races and then they go, they go crazy. Yeah. And they celebrate. And, and it's just incredible to watch the energy that she uh, generates. It's just truly wonderful. They all worship her. He's only got one more race to go, by the way, in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be the most tearful and emotional and difficult ending to a splendid career. Of course, we hope she wins, but she has nothing to prove. But it's that kind of uh, ability to 
generate electricity, to generate um, resurgence, to, re, to, to generate rec recovery if you need that, whatever it might be. Um, and animals do it so much better than people because, I mean, people are fine. I have nothing against them, mm -hmm. but um, they don't capture the whole of us in the way that animals often do. I think, and I, I've noticed that a lot of people who lose beloved pets, you know, a dog or a cat or, or a bunny or something that they've had for years and years, and then when they die, yeah, the animal dies, these people are totally bereft. Right. And in some ways it's worse than a human being, you know, because a human being you know is going to die, and, you know, you have a relationship there, and it's now moved into a different phase of the theory and they are currently gone and you are not you're still around um, but there's there's something about an animal and I think it's because um, animals keep us from they, they save us out of our own unconsciousness they become to us real saviors in the sense that they keep us from falling into the worst places we can imagine. Um, they know how to die. They know how to be sick. They understand us probably in a way that we will never understand them. Um, I know when I had, yeah, I had two cats when I was in my 30s, I think it was, and I went through a really bad patch and was suicidal again. But this was really a bad, a bad patch for me. It was a bad time. And I remember sitting in my living room in my favorite chair. I'm very comfortable. And I'm watching television and I have no idea what I'm watching and I really don't care. And I thought, I really have to stop this. I, and I couldn't, I was just trying to figure out how to do this. Should I take too many pills? But I wasn't very good at suicide. I couldn't even think of what pills I should take. Oh, boy. But, um, and I didn't have a gun. And, and didn't want one. And I was too scared of knives. And I began thinking, maybe I'm not a good candidate for suicide. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't let it go. I wouldn't give up the idea until uh, both my cats, which was very unusual. You usually did it one at a time. But both of them happened to jump into my lap at some point in the middle of the evening. And I automatically began, you know, stroking their heads and scratching their ears and doing everything they liked. And I thought, oh, wait, I can't kill myself. Who will feed the cats? Yeah. And I thought, oh, so that was the end of that fantasy. It just sort of evaporated hmm. right in the air. I thought, you know, I can't go. I have to take care of these guys. And then they left my lap. <laughs> mm -hmm. Came just to remind me, no, no, mm -hmm. you you have to worry about. You know, you're not the only one in this. So I I didn't kill myself, and um, the cats lived to ripe old ages. Well, one of them did anyway. And and it was really a saving moment for me. I don't know what would have happened if they hadn't been there, or if they hadn't attacked. Mm -hmm. Way. Mm -hmm. And I heard you say that animals are honest, you know, yes, yes, and, they and that they they carry different energies, right? And I think we need them. I think too. I think so too. I'm sure, dogs are always honest, but you know, <laughs> I'm sure cats are always honest. But even if they're not honest, they know they know things. They know us, and. Seabiscuit was like that. Mm -hmm. He was one of those necessary beings, but he was he so far transcended his sport, his breed, his circumstances, his history. He transcended all of that and became a, a model, a model hero, capital H, um, for the whole world to look at and say, see, that is a racehorse. That is a hero. That is a champion. And I deny it, you know, the only way you could deny it would be to beat him on the track, and that was hard to do. He did lose a couple of races here and there, but it didn't matter. 
Yeah, and he went through some adversity. He had an injury and he had to rehabilitate it at the ranch for about a year and he came back. But I wanted to mention your, you put this in alchemical language when you said that three humans climbed into the cauldron with Seabiscuit and were transformed themselves. Mm-hmm. And Jung believed that the fourth is necessary for completion and that the fourth figure there was Seabiscuit. Right. And that, and that he transformed the people around him, the three around him being his owner, his trainer, and his jockey. Mm-hmm. And we haven't even discussed uh, his relationship with his jockey yet. Oh, yes. But um, you said that they were four lonely, wounded figures. Mm-hmm. And that Seabiscuit brought the broken, scattered pieces together and made them whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's well said. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was you. That's all you. <laughs> um, it's true, you know, and I'm sure this happens many more times than we imagine, mm-hmm. know about. But this was very public, and so it was. It makes even a better story because everybody knew the story, or at least knew most of the story. And the, the but it was it was true. It was a sea biscuit was just floundering. You know, he wasn't floundering around. He was just being an obstinate racehorse mm-hmm. who only ran as fast as he absolutely had to. And. And so, you know, he was never asked to, uh, he, we, nobody ever really even imagined what his potential might be. They just wanted to get some money out of him. And he didn't really care about who his jockey was or who his trainer was or, you know, he just was told to run around the track. So he did. But when these four come together, the jockey, and you know, in the in the in the Laura Hillenbrand's book, which I have to recommend to everybody, it's sure. the best thing, the best book ever written, a biography ever written by anybody about anybody, I think. Um, and I'll I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's Laura Hillenbrand's book on Sea Biscuit. Right, right. It's just absolutely marvelous. The movie was okay, but it wasn't nearly as rich. And complex and interesting, I thought, as Laura Hillebrand, uh, her book, um, which is beautifully written and with real feeling and um, meticulous notes. If you want to check anything out, you got pages and pages of notes. But the reading itself, the text is just lovely and it flows very easily. Um, the three of the the three humans um, all had a lot of baggage uh, and grief that they carried with them, a lot of grief. And I suppose if horses feel grief, which I think they do, Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they do, um, Seabiscuit probably had a lot of that too, neglect, um, disappointment, maybe even pain, we don't know. Um, But when they come together, something gets ignited in all four of them. And the the ignition seems to come from this funny looking little horse. Well actually he wasn't that little, but he was pretty funny looking. Um and they draw their electricity, their re re-ign- reignition in life from him. Because he's very he's young. He hasn't really done anything yet. Mm-hmm. Tom Smith is, when he looks at Seabiscuit for the first time, he sees the future. He sees the horse's future. He sees his own future. And he's already met Charles Howard, who has asked him to find a horse, and he's thinking also of Charles Howard. And he sees he sees something in Seabiscuit that's going to bring something remarkable to fruition. He has no idea what it is. He probably doesn't even have an idea that he has an idea. Right. That he's had such a vision, he just there's some something, something makes him buy that horse right on the spot, which he did. That was at Saratoga, by the way. <laughs> um, which is where the uh, statue of Sea Biscuit is, right? Yes. Is it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's very interesting to me that you know, I don't know who planned it that way, if they planned it at all, but the statue of Sea Biscuit stands at the front entrance 
to the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame, and Secretariat is in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only two statues there. Secretariat is a beautiful statue of him in the atrium in the back. You know, but speaking of Secretariat, um, I hope you don't mind me telling this story. You had no. said that you were in an airport, I think you were at JFK, when Secretariat was running in the Belmont Stakes. Right. And you watched him and he won that race by 31 lengths. It's the longest race in the Triple Crown. I think it's a mile and a half there at Belmont Park. And you said it was a collective event, which mm -hmm. becomes an individual moment and that revisiting it, you know, watching it again mm -hmm. is restorative and redemptive. Mm -hmm. Every time over and over again, those mm -hmm. moments you know, so w I guess people might be wondering, why are we talking about horse racing? You know, and there's something in this for us. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we do share the planet with many other species. Mm -hmm. And um, horses are, well, to me, they're not only beautiful but they're an inter uh, integral part of American history. Actually, they're an integral part of almost any country's history. Um, but for us, you know, if you look at all the ways in which horses have been our companions, our servants, our entertainers, um, they've done all sorts of things for us. Every, everything from carrying the mail and the Pony Express to pulling milk carts in Brooklyn. Um, we could not have we could not have had an America such as we have. Mm. Of course, they were our, our mode of transportation. Right, mode of transportation. They pull they pull carts and buggies. They, um, I mean, it, it's, it, it's impossible to imagine how we would have gotten over the mountains mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. conquered the West. Conquered. There's that it, war language again. The war language, right? But we did. We conquered and battered the West, and whoever was living there had to get out and make yeah. room for us. So it's um, and then they, when when they incorporated, when Native peoples incorporated the horse into their cultures, it changed their cultures as well, um, because they they're so it's a, they're an interesting species because they. Um, how to put it? They're domesticated, but they're not domestic. I should say it the other way around. They're domestic animals. They live with humans, but they're not totally always domesticated. They all and they all have minds of their own. Even the best trained racehorses are trained according to who they are, rather than what the trainer thinks they should be. And so, you know, I remember a couple of years ago in the Kentucky Derby, um, it was a muddy track, it was raining, and the gates opened and the number one horse, the horse in the first gate, first stall, came out and started and would not run. He just stepped out of the gate and he started. Oh. But his name was Thunder Snow. Oh, that was Thunder Snow. That was Thunder Snow. He started bucking like a lunatic. He wanted to get rid of his jockey. He wouldn't run. He tried to go back into the gate. He was just throwing a hissy fit. And so he didn't run. They scratched him right there, even though the race had already started. Well, this whatever was going on with him um, cost him the derby. But on the other hand, he just came back last Saturday and won the Dubai World Cup yeah. for the second time in a row and the only horse ever to do so. So when Thunder Snow decides he's going to run, you better watch. If he's not going to run, there's nothing you can do to make him. I mean, they have very distinct personalities and mm -hmm. likes, likes, and you know. <sighs> so you say that in the final analysis, Seabiscuit called out the heroism in his human partners. He did. He he brought them into his myth. Um. His myth being the myth of the hero, mm -hmm. who is completely ignored and neglected, like in alchemy, you know, the, 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 the thing of greatest worth is usually found in the least expected place. Yes. You find gold and filth. You find valuable things in the gutter, you know, um, in piles of garbage, you find diamonds. It's that sort of thing. 
and that is what it describes his early years very well. Uh, nobody saw anything in him, so nobody did anything with him or for him. And when he found Tom Smith and Charles Howard and finally let uh, Red Pollard get on him, <laughs> uh, he seemed to know this was his place, this was his calling, this is where he's supposed to be. And he treated them all very well. No sniping or biting or you know, kicking around or anything. He just was, you, know, you had to have another horse to do that to him, like War Admiral, his, his rival. Um, Who he beat in a match race. Yes, yes. He was, and he was a worthy rival. I mean, he was a good rival to have. He won the Triple Crown the year before. Mm-hmm. My goodness, how could you, you know, how can you beat war? I don't know. Nobody could beat war, I don't know. Especially this little one from nowhere. But man, did he put on a show? Mm. One of the links. And he, I think he broke the Admiral's heart because he never, never went to war again. Yeah. <laughs> There are some documentaries out there about Seabiscuit. Um, they're even available for free on Amazon Prime. And then there is the movie, the Hollywood motion picture called Seabiscuit, um, that depicts the story. And Dr. Cowan show, showed some clips of that during her lecture. So I will put links to those in the show notes. And I'd like to move on to the second topic of vocation, and you tie Seabiscuit into this a little bit too. This is, I think, a very important topic because it's something that people struggle with, which is having a career versus having a vocation, and not to be divisive, but (laughs) <laughs> Would you tell us what the difference is? What what really is a vocation, and why is this important in Jung's psychology? Oh, well, that's a large question, too. Um, I, think the, I think the difficulty, at least the, the difficulty that Americans have, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I think Americans have, like me, have a difficult problem with it because we've been so ingrained with the idea that the individual is the most important unit of existence and and we each want to be one, mostly, Mm -hmm. and and we've got it all mixed up with... um, self-support, self-direction, self-management, self-advancement, self, 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 self. In fact, when we take pictures now of ourselves, we call them selfies. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how narcissistic you can get, but I guess that's probably it. Um, so we, we have it mixed up with other ideas which have nothing to do with the idea of individuation. I mean, you can be, you can be, it's possible to become perfect, well, not perfectly, almost, you know, fully individuated, or as, as far as you can go with that, in a, in a large, very large collective group. It doesn't have anything to do with the number of people who are with you, that's the collective, but the individuated person is the one who has found the path, or discovered, or been shown the path they're supposed to follow. In life, now that sounds a lot like fate or destiny, and maybe it is. Um, I don't know, but it seems to me that we all come into the world with some sense of, not a conscious sense, but with some, uh, what's the word, potential Mm -hmm. to sense that there are certain things that we need to do and want to do. When those two come together, you pretty well got a vocation. And if they don't come together, then it's up to the individual to figure out which is which. Which is what, what is what is it I need to do and what is it I want to do. And we're not very good at making that. Yeah. We're not good at making a distinction because we seem to think that most of our our, our wants are actually needs. And so he just, I need this from you. I need this from you. I need you to do this. I need you to be that. I need, 
I have to do this, I must do that, this and that. And the motive for why one, that is why that is needed um, needs to be really explored as deeply as possible. That's one of the good things analysis does for people. It doesn't take anything at face value. It looks at the below, <clears throat> below and deeply, and you know, from the underside. Um, what is it that's driving this need? Is it really a need, or is it something you just want so badly you can hardly stand it? Which is totally different. You know? I and mean, when I was a kid, what I needed was very different from what I wanted. Um, I needed to go to school, but I didn't want to. I needed to, you know, be certain ways because I was a girl and in those days it was really rough being a girl because there wasn't anything girls could do. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do. I wanted to be a drummer in a band. That didn't work. Um, I wanted to be an artist like my dad. That didn't work. I had no talent. I wanted to be a jockey and that didn't work because there weren't any women jockeys that I knew of and I was too tall anyway. I missed it by about an inch. Mm-hmm. They- restrictions in those days and I when I passed my height restriction I started walking with my head down and my shoulder oh. stooped over so I could so nobody would notice I had passed the height you know <laughs> my father said you're walking like an old lady mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was right you know so I, I gave that up um I wanted to move cattle in the Rockies well I did that so that doesn't count I wanted mm-hmm. to be a Driver. I wanted to go to outer space. I, I, there were all sorts of things I yeah. really desperately wanted to do, and I thought, well, if I don't do one of those, what will I do? Right. And you know, my mother, my mother's stock answer was always the same one: "Well, you'll get married and have children." Oh no! Oh God, no! Anything. <laughs> be a drummer in a band, rock band, and have children. That didn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it was. It was. It was. I, I. I. I think I had a very large sense of self, with a large yes, that I wanted to make happen somehow. But I didn't see how that was going to work if all I had to do was learn English grammar and how to and algebra. And I thought, I mean, what does algebra have to do with anything? So school was very difficult for me, but I'm glad I did it. I mean, I'm glad I stayed in school. <laughs> Not that I had any choice, but. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't really what I wanted. That was what I needed in order to get to the point where I could have something of what I wanted. So if I hadn't been a reader and done all that writing in English classes, I don't know that I ever I would have been um, in the position of, be, of of wanting to write and being able to. I don't know that I would have done it without that, you know, necessary foundation for what I desired. Mm -hmm. So where does the call come in? So you have these wants and things you have to do, things you want to do. And you also had said that your desire is a hint at what you're called to do. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. I think that I can remember when I was eight years old uh, for my eighth birthday, my parents gave me a portable typewriter. A Hermes typewriter, wow. which if I had known anything about mythology in those days, I would have said, oh, a Hermes typewriter. Yeah, I like that. He's the god of, you know, communication. Mm-hmm. And I thought, how could I not have a Hermes typewriter? <laughs> I have a Hermes typewriter. That's what I wrote my first manuscript on, the one I had to stop because of technical difficulties. Okay, all right. And so I would sit there on the floor banging away on my typewriter, and I just loved doing the typing. and. And if only I could think of something to say, and it was right around that time, I think, that I, I, I had an image of a huge stack of clean white paper, online, plain, just clean white paper, and the stack was about three feet tall, and I imagined I would fill all those pages up with my book, because I had no idea what the book would be about or anything, but it was just this image of a stack of paper as if it was calling to me, write on me, write on me, write something on me. And I kept thinking, I will, I will, I will. And this didn't happen until decades later. 
But when I finished my first book, I thought, okay, there's the first tip of the stack. And now for another tip of the stack, go to another book. And the lectures and the reviews and the writings and the, the books that did come eventually, it, just, it was just wonderful. I was never happier than when I was working on some new idea or, mm. or whatever. I would just, it, to me, that was as close to heaven as I would ever get. And it was wonderful, and it, it was some, in some way it fulfilled that first image, that early image of this big stack of paper that I could fill up with my words and hope that they meant something. And that's what I mean by fulfilling. The, ful, I, I really think writing has been my vocation. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really intended to be a jockey. First of all, I could never get up that early, and I could never restrain my eating to about two calories per day. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and I really wasn't cut out to be a drummer in a band, although I did learn to play the drums, and I did play with a little trio, and we had a lot of fun. But I was never a star. And I wasn't cut out to go to outer space, because there wasn't any way to get to outer space in those days. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all these things that I wanted to do, I did move cattle in the Rockies, as I said, but (laughs) other than that, all the other fantasies were just things I wanted to do, but they weren't my vocation. But the fact that my vocation seems to have been launched by this early image, and I think a lot of kids have have an image of some sort. They're not taught necessarily to pay attention to it or Mm -hmm. even to Anybody, what they are, but they have very, very um, interesting and sometimes very powerful images of in which they can almost see themselves doing something, whatever it might be, and and if if that's really what they're supposed to do, with luck and enough, you know, uh, circumstances to make it possible, like money, housing, you know. Um, people who love them, you know, a little nurturing here and there. Well, if if that is present, then it is very possible to make that fantasy become a true thing, the way they are in life, and expressive of who they are, and that's their vocation. And you say that vocation requires a sacrifice to achieve, you know, to become a personality, that it's an achievement, it's acquired and that isolation is required. Why is isolation required? Well, I think isolation is required in the sense that it's, I think of it as a, I think of it as a carving tool where you have a block of wood or a block of ice or something, and you want to carve a a shape, uh, sculpt it into something. And you can't do that with people interfering all the time. Yeah. But with, even, even when they're distracting, I can't write with a radio on. Right, me either. Even though I sort of tune it out to white noise, a lot of people, a lot of writers do that. I can't do that. Um, I have, to, And I have to not have anybody in the house. <laughs> um, very difficult to me to, for me to write when there's anybody else around. Disturb the air. And when the air is disturbed, then my communication tends to shut down. Mm-hmm. And uh, some artists are like that. They can't paint if there's anybody around. It's, and sometimes it takes a long period of isolation. Um, I worked, when I was working on the Melancholy book, um, I had started at least 20 times, or 19 or 20 times I started, because I never got to, very far into it before I had to stop it and do something else that took a lot of time, such as being director of training or president of the interregional or something that took years. Mm-hmm so much to do and I had a full practice besides that so it was it was very tiring it didn't make me rich unfortunately but it was it took a lot of energy (laughs) and I loved doing it all I didn't want to stop so uh, the book kind of took a back seat for a long time but once I got into it that seemed to be moving pretty well except that there were all these interruptions you know I was home people would call you know I'd have to stop to see patients I would have I never resented them, obviously. I really loved working with people, but it, I mean, I had, a, I had a terrific life so far. <laughs> but 
there was, I couldn't seem to get through the book, and I thought, I just need to get, I need new, I need a new space mm-hmm. that's only mine. And so, in the middle, of the dead of winter, I think it was the week before or after, somewhere around there, uh, Christmas, and it must have been 2003, something like that. I, I just canceled everything, and I rented a, a cabin, a very modern, lovely, comfy cabin. Mm-hmm. Uh, shore of Lake Superior, about two and a half hour drive from my house, and I drove up there with my computer and my printer and my stack of white paper, <laughs> and um, you know a few books I thought I'd need, and that was it. And I wrote the entire uh, two thirds of the, the last two thirds of the oh, book wow. in six days. Did you? It just poured out. Yeah. It just poured out, and there was no distraction. And it was winter, so there were not even there was hardly any wildlife around. Mm-hmm. I went looking for moose tracks, but didn't find them. Mm-hmm. But, but I had a real regimen that that was so nourishing to me. And of course, the landscape was just exquisitely beautiful. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that's what I mean by isolation. I only told one person where I was going and gave them a phone number in case they needed to get me for some reason. And um, so nobody called. There was nothing in particular going on. <clears throat> and it was wonderful. I slept almost eight hours a night. I got up early in the morning. I worked for four or five hours. I stopped for lunch and a long walk. I went back to work for another four or five hours and then watched a basketball game at night or something or a movie mm-hmm. and to bed. And it was the best six days I ever had in my whole life. Wow. Just about, and I felt so um, at peace. Yeah, I felt peaceful. I thought, I'm fine. This is what I was born to do. Mm. This and is what you were born to do. So you say that vocation means to be called, and yeah. and, and if you don't answer the call, then what happens? I think you get sick. Yeah. You get neurotic and pathologized in some way, or your body takes the punishment. Mm-hmm. And you also say that we go back to being a cog in the giant psychic machine. And I'd like to talk about a little bit about the collective, because if we don't individuate, then we are a member of the collective. Mm-hmm. And and that, but but those of us who do step out of the collective, we're considered a threat, right? We're an outcast. Right. Although individuation, I think, um, really includes both. Mm. That was very clear about this. I think that you can be a member of the collective and individuate at the same, not at the same time necessarily, but you're you're never one, just one or the other. It's not an either or situation. Mm-hmm. That you 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 if you undertake to follow whatever your path is. Um, you do step out of the collective and you can see it from your own personal vantage point. Oh, that's the collective, but this is me. But when you become really me, <laughs> you can step back into the collective and work subversively there to try to change the collective. Subversively, I love it. And that it is also a necessity, right, to return to the collective and bring something back. It is. That you acquired when you had stepped out during that time that you had stepped out, like you retreated into the woods for a while and you wrote this piece of work, this magnificent book. And so that's your contribution to the collective is you put that work, right? Am I saying this right? Yes. I I Thank you very much for calling it magnificent. (laughs) Um, It truly is. I do think it's my best work. But you're right, it's it's um, something you said before that made me think of this and now I've forgotten it. Um, you, you step out of the collective. It's very hard to do it if you don't. Oh, what you were saying about being a threat. I think that's true. I think anybody who strikes off on their own path, you know, to, to go where no one has gone before, I believe we said in the beginning of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. It really is a trek, and it's it's among your own stars, your own galaxy. You need to explore your own universe within yourself as well, and then 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 you begin to see the external universe in 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 different terms, 
or there you can see ways in which things need to change or should change or you can help change them um, and it's not an either or you go back to the collective because you already are in the collective you know you're always going to be a human being in some some group or another you're probably not going to go off and live with pandas although they're very cute um, and you're probably not going to go off and live with wolves although they're pretty too um, but you're a human being so you're always going to live with human beings and one needs a certain isolation from that um, otherwise you just kind of drift mm-hmm. you know, there are people who isolate themselves and even even rock stars have you seen this happen where they they're hardly out of the collective they are in the collective, they're supported by the collective. You know, thousands of people turn out to hear them in, in concerts and all of that. And yet, those are, some of those people just end up drifting because they have, they don't seem to have an anchor within themselves that they know, oh, this is me, this is not them. And, and that's very, it, it's not only dangerous, it's very painful, I think. It's a feeling of being separated from the whole rest of your species. Mm-hmm. I think that would be very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And you <laughs> said that heroes need to give something back in order to redeem the collective. That's right. I think so. Um, and that by yeah. heroes, that let me just say that you yeah. had also mentioned that Jung believed that the one who steps out is heroic, and that it is a, a heroic act. That's right. I think so. And, I, and, and by definition, then, individuation, the process, which is a process, by the way, not, I don't know that it's an end result. I don't know anybody who ever really would say, I'm fully individuated. I Thank don't think you. that's yes. possible. But they will say, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, something interfered. That's Okay. Uh, proof of Jung's association, word association test, and the interference there. Um, <laughs> um, oh yes, that when you when you to, that individuation is one of the ways the myth is enacted. You uh, while you while you are individuating, whether you know it or not, whether you're trying to or not. If it is, if you're following the way you're supposed to go, that by itself is heroic, because it's not what other people are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, people, uh, too many people do what they're told. Yeah, and think that they really like it and everything, and they may may pay good money, and it gives them all kinds of perks, perhaps or whatever it might be, but they're not. Um, necessarily becoming who they're fully who they are Mm -hmm. or if somebody criticizes the way we're living our life and tell tells us that it's not balanced and that we need to live a more balanced life and i heard you say well what would happen if someone told einstein to live a more balanced life or what would have happened if he listened Mm -hmm. well this is it i mean you know they kept telling michelangelo not to work so hard too Mm. And, and that the ones who are the movers and the shakers, those are the ones who are one-sided and single-minded. Exactly. I mean, we have this so backwards. Where did we get this idea that balance was such a good thing? <laughs> I love it. You know, I mean, that's fine. But, you know, the moon isn't balanced either. Mm. One, it's always dark. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, why don't astronomers send a message to whoever runs the moon and say, you know, why don't you turn around once in a rare while? Mm-hmm. And we could use a little sun. Mm. A, little, a little light never hurt anybody. You know, things like that. Right, right. <laughs> it, it, again, come bring, it takes you back to language. Um, we use these words as if, you know, balance is terrific and everybody should do it. Well, not me. Yeah. It's okay, Jung's notion of fidelity to the law of one's own being, oh. mm-hmm. right? So w- what does that mean? Well, 
Oh, he said it so well. It's <laughs> <laughs> to, tr- to trust and be loyal to who you are. And yeah. that's how, that's how you develop your personality. Um, it, yeah, it's about not doing, it's about living your life in such a way that you approve of your life. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's not doing things because someone else would approve of it or doing things, uh, being who you are is perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to just be loyal and faithful to who you are and you don't have to be balanced. You just have to be loyal and faithful to who you are. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I I have a colleague who... uh, uh, I don't see her very often, but every once in a while we get together, and usually in a group or something. And if I ever bring up, and it was just general discussion, nothing particularly professional or anything, and we're talking about different things, and and if I bring up something that I particularly enjoyed or saw or something at the racetrack, she just throws her head back and rolls her eyeballs as if to say, oh, here we go again. Oh, no. And it, I f- it's really upsetting to me it yeah. should, at this point. But I think uh, after all this time, she should know, yes, I love the racetrack. Right. Um, and so, you know, and other people can have things that, you know, they're somewhat fanatical about too, but she doesn't roll her eyes about them. Oh. And what, what it makes me think of is that... Uh, I I am I've been I've been a fanatic about horses since I was seven years old when I first rode. It was my first time on horseback, mm-hmm. not counting the ponies every year. Um, and I thought, and that has been a path of mine that I have. Uh, it's been a passion of mine for let's see, going on uh, seven day. De- well, well, yeah, seven decades now. So. There's no way I'm going to change, and I don't see why I should. Mm-hmm. And there, I have some friends who are worried that I'm going to be addicted to gambling. And after 35 years of having a racetrack out here, um, I'm not bankrupt yet, so I guess I'm not gambling that much. And, you know, there's no evidence for any of the prejudices they have. And so they won't see that part of me as a reality of mine but it is very deeply a part of who I am Mm -hmm. and you don't have to like racing to you know or even you don't even have to like horses to to understand that that is who I am I go crazy over it I'm always 12 years old at the racetrack Mm -hmm. I never outgrow it I just and I don't want to yeah to me it's the most magical thing in the world Mm -hmm. sometimes it pays pretty good too Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that, you know, if I were ashamed of it, if I want, I didn't want anybody to know, <clears throat> if I myself were worried about, you know, becoming a, a gambling addict, um, then I then I would be denying something of my very being. Because I, when I was a kid, I when I first got on horse, that was the first time I really understood that my body was my body and it belonged on top of a horse and not next to it. Mm. That way I could be tall and strong, have a lot of power and people would literally look look up to me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. When I was on a horse, I was taller than anybody else and I could run fast and I could do wonderful things and, and I incorporated that somehow into my own my my own sense of being, you know, so that I was able to. And I thought, oh, I can do things like cross country ski or ride a bike or do all sorts of things, you know. I can do that, uh, and my horse can do this, and together we can do something else. And it seemed so natural to me. It was so automatically. Uh, sensual and physically affirming that I don't know where I would be without that. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe something else would have come along and caught my fancy, but nothing like a big, strong horse. My goodness. Yeah. Especially if he liked you. Yeah. 
my horse and I were really good friends. Mm -hmm. Years. He understood everything about me. The trouble was he was a practical joker, and I never cured him of that. But oh. so cute about it, I didn't really care to. <laughs> but there's something about um, being faithful and true and loyal and standing up for the worst parts of you. It's easy to do that for the nice parts of yeah, you. It's so. not so easy. Yeah, not so easy for the bad parts of you. Even the ugly parts, they're, they're yours and you have to to own it and keep it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because it's yours, it's not anybody else's. That makes it unique by itself. So faithful to all of you, not just parts of you. And you had mentioned that Elvis, Elvis Presley, knew that he had a destiny by the age of 10, that he loved music and that's all he loved and all he cared about. And everybody laughed at his style and he refused to change. He refused to not be himself, that he was absolutely faithful to the law of who he was. That's right. And, you know, I don't know what drove him <clears throat> to his death, um, you know, by overdosing. But um, I, I never knew him intimately well <laughs> uh, that way. <clears throat> but it may have been a point at which he simply couldn't maintain that loyalty anymore. Mm. It's possible. Interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Dying at 42 when you are the best known and one of the best loved people in the world. Um, that's, you know, that's hard to take when you're only 42. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, and it's a hard thing to hold fast to that. It's so easy and it's getting easier to just give it all up and say, oh, the hell with it, you know, I'm just going for the money. And you, you betray yourself with that. It's, it's, it's very hard to live with yourself if you have to lie your way through life. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't need to point out examples who happen to hold eye office at the present moment. Um, but lying is not the way to be loyal to who you truly are. Is it possible that some people just don't have the capacity to live a life of fidelity to the law of one's own being? I'm not sure, but I think so. I mm -hmm. think people who just don't have the capacity. I mean, I think our current president is an example of that. I think he was born without that capacity. I think he's a psychopath, which means he's empty. There's no real soul there. There's no movement. There's no change. There's no capacity for any of that. There's no capacity, and there's no empathy. There's no, no way to relate to other people on a human level. They can only relate on, the, on a psychopathic, narcissistic level. And so it's only them, and they're all alone in their own universe. Nobody what do we do when we encounter people like that? What do we do what? When we encounter those types of people. When, where? Just when when those people cross our path or enter our environment, what do we do? How do we interact with psychopaths, people well, with no souls? That is a really hard question to yeah. answer. And it's a very individual answer. People do different things. I personally get as far away from them as I can. Mm -hmm. I find them toxic. Mm hmm um, and I can't physically, literally, I can't tolerate them. I get sick to my stomach and I have to throw up. Uh, I had two of them in the house in my early years before I really knew anything about anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants. And um, in the space of about three years, I had two of the two young men who came for analysis. And it turned out they only wanted to tell me everything they knew. Right. And they did, which didn't take a whole lot of time. <laughs> it was pretty comprehensive. <laughs> and so they would bring in these dreams and tell me what they meant, and then they would tell me about this and what they were going to do about that, and hear lots of future fantasies. And, you know, and some of it was kind of bloody stuff, but it was just, uh, uh, 
And I finally realized after a while, with the first one anyway, that there were there was something not there. It wasn't that there was something that was there that was bothering me. It was mm-hmm. something that wasn't there that was bothering mm-hmm. me. Something missing. And it was the inability to make what felt like a real human connection about anything at any point. And so it was very difficult. For me, it was really kind of easy in a way because since they did all the talking, I didn't have to say anything. But I also realized, especially when the first one did not pay his bill, I, I realized that he's not he's not coming to me for analysis. He's coming. He doesn't want, he doesn't have any need to understand himself. He already does, or think he thinks he does. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's not why I want to work with him. I want to work with somebody who really wants to discover something. So why did he come to you? I th- I'm not sure, but I think it was a way, one of the ways of showing off how much he knew. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't have a lot of Jungian analysts around here in Minnesota in those days. Right. And even the country hadn't really discovered much of Jung and had popularized what they had, so that didn't help much. But I think it was just, uh, I was another uh, platform on which he could perform. Yeah. I stopped going to workshops at one point, or even lectures, seminars, because I found that audience members, instead of asking questions, would would sta- would raise their hand and stand up and sort of give a little lecture to the presenter. And I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't care what the people in the audience have to say. I came to listen to the speaker, Mm -hmm. not the people in the audience. And I find that too, with this podcast, you know, sometimes receiving comments or messages from people telling me that, that, you know, I don't know this, and I don't know that, and I have this deficiency and that deficiency. The the podcast is me interviewing analysts and asking questions. I'm I'm asking the qu- questions of the experts. I want to learn, and I know my audience wants to learn. And when I come across people that just want to tell me, I, I want to interview the experts, not somebody who hasn't done the work, hasn't done the research, hasn't been analyzed. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe read a few books, wants to lecture at me and tell me how much I don't know. I, I don't know. I just find that kind of odd. Well, you know, it is, we do live, uh, I can't remember the name of the book or who wrote it some years ago. We do live in a very narcissist culture. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's part of our, it's part of our, uh, what's the word? national pastime is admiring mm. Mm. and if you don't get enough people to provide that amount of ad, uh, the amount of admiration you need then you have to go find out go to elsewhere and try to cultivate it mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so you know there's there's always somebody in some group somewhere who will do that you know stand up and just sort of hog the whole all the attention Sometimes for me, this has happened to me more times than I can count, where somebody stands up and, as you said, starts lecturing everybody, including me. Right. And they go on and on and on, and you have to find a way to in, in, in gently inter, inter, uh, uh, redirect the, the, the discussion. Mm-hmm. Everybody else gets bored. Um, and for me... I'm happy if they want if they ask a question, but it it's and then answer it themselves. <laughs> but with you, I kind of stop at that point, and the, you know I want to learn something from this too. I'm not here just to entertain. You know, I have things to say, but I'd like to hear what other people think about them. You know, if they have other ideas about things, that's good. But just to, you know, to perform just for the sake of performing and to show off how, you know, how much you know, that's, that just doesn't, doesn't cut it for me. Mm-hmm. It's just a very narcissistic, you know, thing that happened during the day. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was wondering if there was anything we hadn't covered that you would like to say before we wrap up? 
I think we should do the whole thing again because there's so many more things I'll be I, I want to say after we stop. <laughs> well, you can definitely come back for more. Uh, I often have guests come back because we can't cover everything and you have a lot of material and I would love it if you would come back and we can continue the discussion. Oh, I would love it. Okay, great. I just love it. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Yes. It's been a lot of fun. I'm glad. So should we wrap up? Let's wrap up. Okay. So on behalf of all of the listeners, I would again like to thank Dr. Cowan for her time today. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed here today. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, and Spotify. So with special thanks to the C.G. Jung Center in Evanston, Illinois, and a shout out to the BTS Army, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>